All right, welcome to Cascade Hills Church this morning. I'm so glad that you chose this place to worship. I also want to welcome the people watching online each and every week. Uh, you may or may not know, but thousands of people watch online each week. Uh, on average, about uh, 33 different states and about 22 different countries every single week. So from wherever you are, we want to give you a warm Cascade Hills welcome. We thank you for tuning in. Well, I want to cover a subject that's pretty basic today, but here's why I want to do so. I want to do so because we've seen so many this year conversions of people giving their life to God who are new Christians. Matter of fact, we're doing a baptism service this all this weekend, and here's why. We have seen every single day of the, the week in 2008, we, 18, eight, we don't want to go back that far, do we? We have seen people give their life to God, and we've seen baptisms every single day. Day, night, rain, shine. Our baptismal pastor, he will text me a picture every single day of someone giving their life to God and being baptized. The other night, he sent me one, and it was raining and lightning, and I had to tell him, listen, I want them to meet Jesus. I just don't want them to meet Jesus tonight. So if you could just hold off on that, that that'd be great. And so the message I want to cover with you today is just very basic. It's very simplistic. But it is very, very important. And for you to understand kind of where I'm coming from, uh, Andy Stanley taught this philosophy years ago, and I, and I hung on to it. But to understand where I'm coming from, um, I'd like to give you kind of just a background of how I grew up. In case you don't know, I was a preacher's kid. Shocker, right? And uh, I grew up as a preacher's kid. I believe you see things just a little bit different, really do. I believe that you see the church different. I believe that you see uh, religious uh, people different. As a matter of fact, if you're a preacher's kid, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you can see a preacher's, uh, other preacher's kid, and you kind of know them. And, and you can see religious people like the religious nuts coming like, you know, a mile and a half away or so. I mean, you can just spot them. Like, I remember as a, as a preacher's kid growing up in, in church, and dad would get done with a sermon, and uh, I'd, I'd be over here, and someone would come up to me and say, mm, did you feel that today? And I go, no, no, I didn't. Was I supposed to feel something? Did you feel it? You felt it. I, know, I didn't know if they had a bad burrito. I don't, I, I don't know. Did, did, you, did you feel that? You felt it, didn't you? No, I did not feel it. It's, I, I felt the Spirit of God at 11 o'clock, so just, just move the Spirit of God. I didn't know. No, the 11 o'clock is usually packed. You just felt a lot of bodies in the room, a lot of, pe- a lot of people. But as a preacher's kid, you'd see that. And here's why I know that's true. You could take that same group of people that felt the Spirit of God at 11 o'clock, you could put them at a Kenny Chesty concert, and they wouldn't feel the Spirit of God, would they? They'd be full. They, they'd feel great, you know, hear great music, a great concert. Maybe they'd feel coconut rum, but they wouldn't feel the Spirit of God, right? And, and, and so you'd kind of see that coming. You'd see uh, religious people coming. You'd see the church differently. And it's because you've been around religious activities your whole life. And, and you'd see things different. And I want to talk to you just for a moment today, because if we're not careful, you too can start seeing through the lens of your religious activities instead of what God really wants. And if you're not careful, you can begin to see through that God loves me based on my religious activities and how much I do for him and how much I, I check off the list and I do this and I don't do that. And if you're not careful, you can fall into that same trap. And Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus does not need more of your religious activities Jesus wants a relationship with you. And if you're not careful, like me, you can start to fall into the game if you're around church too long, where you start playing Jesus says so, or the Bible says so. It's kind of like Simon says. Remember we grew up, Simon says do this, Simon says do that. If you don't do what Simon says, you're out. And if you're not careful, if you, if you get around the religious game too long or in the church too long, you'll start playing subconsciously without you knowing the games of Jesus says so, the Bible says so. And, and Jesus says do this, and Jesus says don't do that, and the Bible says do this, the Bible says do all that. And you'll start, without knowing it, start playing this game of Jesus says so, the Bible says so, so much that you'll start basing God's love for you off of your list of stuff and religious activities. And then you know what happens? Sometimes if you play Jesus says so, so much, like he says, don't look at this, don't do that, don't do this, the Bible says this, and you start playing it, and then, then you start getting judgmental, don't you? You start getting mad at other people and then I play Jesus says so like you're supposed to be playing Jesus says so. And if you're honest, in the quiet times when you lay your head down on the pillow, you think, I'm playing Jesus says so very good today and they're not playing by the same rules. And, and, and honestly, they look like they're happier not playing Jesus says so. And, and, and that's what happens. And you'll start judging other people because they're not playing Jesus says so like you, you say so. And, and, and then you, sometimes, you know what happens if we're honest? We just, it's, it's, it's exhausting. I mean, Jesus says do this, the Bible says do that, the Bible says, and if you don't, you're out. And some days you feel really good, and you feel like, man, I've done all this stuff, God must really love me today. Other days you do all this stuff, and you, you maybe miss one, and you feel like, ugh, God's really displeased with me, doesn't love me as much today. And if you're not careful, you can base God's love for you based off of your works, 
based off of your works and based off of you did all the stuff and all the do's and, and don'ts. And it's a really bad place to be because Jesus doesn't want that. He doesn't need more of your religious activity. Jesus wants an authentic relationship with you. And maybe you're here today and maybe you dropped out of church and maybe you're watching online and you're trying to hold deal back. And the reason you dropped off was because you got tired and exhausted of trying to play Jesus says so or the Bible says so. And you, you just couldn't do it. You said, I, I give in. I'm done. I, I can't do it no more. I, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm tired. I'm out. I don't care if I'm out. I'm out, right? Or maybe you're unchurched and you're here today and your friend brought you and, and you're here. And, and the reason you're, you didn't want to come to church this morning, they kind of drug you into the whole deal, is because you look at us and think, I don't want to be like that. Can I tell you? Neither do I. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a religious quack. I don't want to be a nut. And you don't have to be. Jesus wants a relationship with you where you are. And so I want to talk to you today just something very simplistic about how God doesn't necessarily need your religious activities. He wants a relationship with you. When I look at the four accounts of Jesus, I, you know, sometimes I wish, maybe we can do it today. Maybe just for 30 minutes we can do this today. We can kind of press the re reset button on everything we know, everything we've learned. And just for a little bit, we could just follow the Gospels, the people that followed Jesus, and follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and, and just see the, what the life of Jesus shows us and what he says. Because everything that I see when I follow the life of Jesus is this, that Jesus is highly relational, that God is highly relational. Remember Jesus once said, the reason I come is so that you know what the Father is like. And you remember he, he equated himself to three different things in the Bible. He, one is he said, I can be your father and you can be my child. Now, that's highly relational, isn't it? Remember the other one? He said, look, I'm the vine. If you remain in me and you're the branch, and if you remain in me, you'll have much more of a fruitful life. Relational. Remember he said, I I'm, the, I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep. And I know today that doesn't mean much. It's a kind of a bad example, right? <laughs> but, but he said, it's highly relational, right? And so every time Jesus is talking, he's saying, I, I want a relationship. I I've come to have a relationship. And here's why this is important. If your approach to spirituality, if your approach to being a Christian is anything more or anything less than relational, then maybe, just maybe, you've missed something. If your approach to being a Christian, to being a Christ follower is anything more than relational or anything less than relational, then maybe, possibly maybe, maybe you've missed something along the way. And maybe you've got caught up in the game that I got caught up in. And you're playing so much of this over here that you've started basing God's love for you based off of your works. And that's not the approach that God wants us to have. I've often said that religion is our attempt to reach God, but Jesus is God's attempt to reach us. And Jesus wants a relationship. And here's why this is important. Because you've been invited to an extraordinary relationship with your creator. And if you're not careful, <laughs> I see it happen all the time. If you're not careful, you can get caught up in religious activities and you can miss the most important divine relationship of your life. You can miss having a personal relationship with your creator. You can do all the do's and all the don'ts and all the stuff, and you miss it. And yeah, you, you may feel better some days and worse other days, but you miss a relationship with Jesus, and that's what Jesus wants. When I look through the Gospels, I find it interesting that you see people of all different uh, spectrums. You see poor, you see rich, you see religious people, you see spiritual people, you see irreligious people. And guess what? Every time Jesus would come by and he'd simply say, follow me. Amen. Just follow me. Follow me. And, and sometimes we make it way more complicated than we do. He, he rarely ever would say, stop doing this, then you can follow me. Give up that, then follow me. If you go get right, then follow me. But he always would walk by and he would say, follow me. And he'd extend an invite for them to follow them from wherever they're at. And I believe he extends an invite for us as well. No matter what walk of life you come from today, I believe that Jesus still extends that same invite. And I believe sometimes we complicate it and say, I've got to do all this. And Jesus says, look, I know where you're at. Just follow me. Follow me. Here's why this is important. It's important because I believe that you have no idea, no idea what hangs in the balance of your decision just to follow Jesus. I mean, you have no idea. Can you imagine the people that Jesus hung out with had no idea that thousands of years later, we'd still be reading about them. Had no idea how their life would pan out just by accepting that invitation just to follow him. Now, for each and every one of you, the cool thing is it, is it looks different for everybody, doesn't it? You've got mature believers. You've got new believers. You've got people, and his invitation for you to just follow him is different for everybody. For some of you, it's today getting baptized, and you put it off a long, long time. Or for some of you, your children have been driving you crazy to, to get baptized 
And they've been, mom and dad, I want to get baptized, I want to get baptized, and, and t-ball is taking the place, and then fall ball takes the place, and, and, and all the stuff that, that takes the place. And maybe for you today, you say, you know what, maybe what would happen if I just follow him? And for some of you, it'd be to get into a fellowship, to get into a class. For some of you, it'd be to teach a class. But wherever stage you're at, the same invitation is for you, just to follow him. And I believe this, I really do believe that you have no idea what God can do in your life. You have no idea what God has planned for your life if you would simply follow him. And so that's the message today as we ramp up for it. And what I want to do is I want to just talk about four different stages we find ourselves in our relationship with God. Four different stages. First stage is this, is the irreligious stage. It's the irreligious stage. And that, can I tell you that's okay? If you come from a background and you're not religious at all, that's okay. I'm glad you're here. Matter of fact, our mission is to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ out of irreligious people. It doesn't excite me when we get churchgoers just swapping churches and come here. I had a usher a while back say, Brent, isn't it exciting? I had 11 people today that left their home church, and they're here. Are you excited? I said, I'm not excited at all. I wish they'd go back and stay rooted where they're at. It doesn't excite me. What excites me is when someone comes up and says, hey, we have 11 or 12 or 15 VIP people who have never been to church before. They're here today. Oh, now that excites me. Why? Because I want the irreligious crowd. I want them to come in and hear about the love of God. And so maybe you find yourself in the irreligious stage today. Can I tell you that that doesn't exclude Jesus' invite for you to simply follow him? In all the historical writings of the life of Jesus, I find this hilarious. You rarely ever see him hanging out with religious people. <laughs> you don't. Now, you always see him hanging out with irreligious people, don't you? All the time. It, it was almost as if he was very comfortable around irreligious people and religious people he was very uncomfortable around. There's a guy named Matthew. Now, I love studying the people that Jesus chose and who he chose to be around. This guy named Matthew, if you're not careful, you just read over it fast. You don't see the character of the guy. Matthew was a disgusting guy, okay? Maybe I'll be the first guy to tell you that. He was a guy that you wouldn't want your children hanging out with, that you wouldn't want to hang out with. Matthew was a guy who was absolutely disgusting. Matthew was a tax collector. He was a Jew, but yet he had been hired by the Romans to collect taxes on his own people. The Romans paid him a lot of money, and Matthew was rich. But get this, as long as Rome got their money, Matthew could inflate and he could add to it however much he wanted. And so Matthew would cheat his own people and became rich off of cheating his own people. I mean, Matthew was the scumbag of scumbags for his day. I mean, that's the truth. It, it, it really, Matthew was, Matthew was a guy you don't want to hang out with. Matthew in today's time would be like the equivalent of a guy who's a middle-aged guy selling drugs to your middle schoolers at the mall. That's Matthew. But yet we see something. When Jesus comes around, he goes up to Matthew and he extends them an invitation. Look what he says, Matthew 9.1. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's office. And he said to him, and here's the invitation, same invitation every time follow me. So he arose and he followed Jesus. Now I can almost, when I'm reading the accounts of, of this and he says, follow me, I can almost hear like an audible groan uh, from the other crew, you know, the disciples. And he looks at Matthew in that tax clerk's book and he says, follow me. And you hear everybody else, Andrew and Peter go, oh no, no, Jesus, not him, anybody but him. I know I get it. You don't like being around the religious people. I, I get it. But just, let's just pick some middle ground. You pick from the bottom of the barrel. I know we're fishermen. I know we stink, but this smell washes off. Matthew, though, that it's from the inside. I mean, I don't want to be associated with him. And if I'm associated with him, then you're associated with him. And we're all associated with him. And it's a bad rap. You don't want to be around Matthew. But yet Jesus looks and he says, I know where you are. Follow me. Now, I find it fascinating that Jesus doesn't do this. Jesus doesn't go up to Matthew and say, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, give up this, this, and this, and you can follow me, okay? Hey, hey, Matthew, if you want to stop cheating your people, stop cheating them, then you can be a part of my crew. Hey, hey, Matthew, if you, you give this up, if you stop doing that, you don't do that, guess what? You may, if you do it all right, you do all that Jesus says and all the Bible says, you do all the stuff right, I'll let you in my crew. Doesn't do it. He looks at Matthew and says, I know where you're at, Matthew. I know all about you. I created you. I like you for who you are, and I want you to follow me. He, here's what religion does. See, religious people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees of those days, religious people do this. They say, if you change, you can 
you can follow us. If you change, you can be in with us. Jesus never said that. He did the opposite. He said, follow me and I'll change you. Follow me and after time, I'll change you. See, that's the difference. And Jesus is highly relational and he says, your irreligious activities and your stuff doesn't keep me from extending, extending an invite for you to follow me. It doesn't cancel that out. And, and I love that Jesus shows us this because it gives us hope, don't it? We read about Matthew. It makes me feel a lot better about myself. When he'd pick a guy like that to, to follow him. And here he is, God in skin, saying, I like you, Matthew. Follow me. I want a relationship with that guy. And he extends that same invitation to you. If you're irreligious, you're here today, you're trying out the whole God thing. What you've done in your past doesn't cancel out Jesus' invitation for you to simply follow him. For you to simply follow him. I love that he said, don't give up, this. Don't, don't do that. He just says, look, follow me. We'll work it out. And just like you and I, just like Matthew, imagine Matthew had no clue what hung in the balance of him stepping out of that tax collector's booth and following Jesus. I mean, we're still reading about Matthew today. Thousands of years later, he changed the world as we know it. And he had no, no idea what hung in the balance of a simple decision just to follow Jesus. I say that to say, neither do you. I don't know if that's getting in a class or teaching a class or being baptized or whatever God's calling you to do. He's simply saying, just follow me. Just, just, just trust me. And you, just like Matthew, have no idea how your life will pan out if you'll take a simple step just to follow Jesus. Now, look what happens next. It says, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. Oh, Lord, he went to Matthew's house. You've got to be kidding me. That behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, I can almost hear Andrew, who used to be a follower of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is cousin of Jesus. I mean, he's a religious guy. And I can almost hear him going, oh, God, we're going in the man's house. And he looked at his brother Peter and said, circle, circle, dot, dot, now i got my tax collector shot. You may want to double up because this guy, not only are now we associated, but now we're going into his home. And his home was big enough, it says he had many tax collectors and many sinners. You know why? Because he was rich. He was cheating his own people. And yet here's Jesus right in the middle. And boy, are his disciples just uncomfortable. I mean, this is out there. They're with the worst of the worst, and they're sitting down with him, and, and they're around these sinners and I just think this is hilarious what happens. When you even read that verse, the Bible is so funny. You got to read your Bible sometimes. It's, it's hilarious. And when you read the Bible, look what Matthew said. If you go back to that last verse, he said there were many tax collectors, many tax collectors and sinners came down and sat down. Matthew is writing this gospel. <laughs> Matthew is saying, I'm at such an elite level of disgust that I can't even be categorized as a sinner. He separates them, many tax collectors and sinners. He's saying, we're in a league of our own, a filth, okay? I can't even just categorize them all up under sinners. We're in a league of our own. And yet here's Jesus right in the middle. Now look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees, that's the religious people, saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard that, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now think about that. Think about how insulting this was to Matthew and his crew. <laughs> He's in Matthew's house. And the Pharisees walk by, and they're on the outside of the deal, and they're not in the inside. And, and they ask his disciples, why does your guy, he's supposed to be a rabbi, he's, he's supposed to be a, a teacher, why is he hanging out with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus says, hey, tell them the healthy don't need a doctor, sick people do. Amen. And Matthew's like, hey, I'm, I'm a cheater, but I'm not dumb. <laughs> you know, you're, you're kind of calling me and my posse sick. I don't know, I'm just reading between the lines. Jesus says, Matthew, you're a tax collector. <laughs> and Matthew says, you're right. High five, pass the gravy. You know what I mean? I mean, he knew who he was. That's, that's just part of it. And so Jesus, though, was extremely comfortable. Here's something I love about, maybe you find yourself in the irreligious spot today. Jesus is always really comfortable being around people who are nothing like him. And, and people that are nothing like him are always really comfortable being around Jesus. Should make us feel better. And so now he finds himself in there, and maybe today you, you're irreligious, and you find yourself saying, would Jesus extend an invitation to me to follow? Absolutely. He extended to Matthew. Hello? Matthew. And he extends you that same invite. And maybe you've said, you know what, I'm a sinner. You don't know what I've done. Well, look at Matthew. Being a sinner doesn't disqualify you from following Jesus. Guess what? Guess what? It qualifies you. Guess what? Everybody who's ever followed Jesus is what? A sinner. People look at the church and they say, well, I can't go in that, that church. Those people are all good. They got it all together. No, 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 we don't. I say this all the time. 
we are all sinners who admit that we're jacked up and we need some help and we need Jesus. And, and, and if you're irreligious and maybe you're, you say, yeah, you don't know what I'm doing, your sin doesn't cancel you out from following Jesus. Let me, let me go a step further. If you're an unbeliever and you say, I've tried the whole thing out, but if I'm being honest, uh, maybe my professor said this or, this, or maybe I heard this, and may, I don't know if I believe the whole Bible. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm there yet. And I don't even know if I believe that Jesus is Lord. Can I tell you something? Now, brace yourselves it still doesn't stop Jesus' invitation for you to follow him. doesn't stop it. If you're an unbeliever, you say, I'm just not there yet. Guess what? Jesus' closest followers were in the same camp. You know, for a long time, they didn't even believe that Jesus was who he says he is. For, I mean, there's one account two years in. Two years after following Jesus, the scripture says he says something, he did something, and the disciples, and it says, they believed. I'm like, after two years? You're walking with them two years, and now you're just believing? Some of them didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ until after he died and rose from the dead. So we get a guy named Thomas. So here, here's, here's Thomas, doubting Thomas. After Jesus goes through his whole ministry, Jesus dies. Here's Thomas says, I think it was all just a game. You know, it was, I don't think he's who. Unless he comes back and I, I touch him and I, I see him, I, I don't believe it. Now think about this. Thomas has to wait until after the resurrection to believe in Jesus. What kind of faith does that take? <laughs> Me and you are like, have levels more faith than Thomas. Yet no time during his ministry did Jesus look at Thomas and say, nah, I, you're out. Simon says, you're done. You don't have enough faith. Don't believe in me. You're done. Maybe you're irreligious today. and You're, you're saying, I'm just learning the whole thing. It does not cancel out Jesus' invitation for you to simply follow him. Because what you'll find, what you'll find is this. Here's what you'll find. Maybe, you, maybe your deal is just to come back next week. Maybe your deal is just to, to read your Bible a couple times a, you know, a day or once a day. As you start following Jesus where you are, you'll find out that Jesus is who he says he is. <laughs> As you start following Jesus wherever you're at, you start saying, okay, I'm just going to open up the New Testament. I'll just start there. I'll start. What you'll find is maybe you don't believe the whole Bible. That's okay. Maybe you don't believe. But as you start following him, I believe that in time you'll realize that, wow, it is inspired. It is in error. It is without fault. And as you start following Jesus, he'll change you. As you start following Jesus, he'll start showing you that stuff. But it does not cancel out Jesus' invitation for you to follow him. It doesn't. And Jesus extends an invitation, if you're irreligious, to follow him. And you have no idea. (laughs) You have no idea, like Matthew, what hangs in the balance of your future just to simply follow him. Now, the second stage is this. You may find yourself in the inquiring stage is what I call it. The inquiring say, you got questions, and, and you, you, you're close to believing the whole deal, but you got questions. Can I tell you, that's okay. I would never encourage you to go to a church where they just say, just believe. What? Yeah. <laughs> you want to find out for yourself. You want to examine. You want to get in a class. We've got this class here. I, I highly recommend it. It's called, we've got tons of different Bible classes, but this class called Discover Class, and they'll tell you just the basics of Christianity. They won't ask you a lot of questions. The most they may ask you is, you know, how long have you been here? That's it. What's your name? But you get to ask them questions. You get to say, hey, what about the, what the Bible says here? Hey, what about the time Jesus says this? And you get to inquire about who Jesus is. It's a fantastic class. You ought to check it out. But you, you ought to, if you're in this stage today, that's okay. You know that the disciples, when I look at the group with Matthew that day, all his sinners, they were in this stage. In the home of Jesus, I mean, in the home of Matthew, they're around Jesus, and they're inquiring who Jesus is. There's four fishermen also that became leaders of the Christian movement. They stayed in this inquiring stage for a long, long time. Andrew, the guy that was giving out the cootie shot early, the, the, the tax collector shot, Andrew was the follower of John the Baptist. And you remember John the Baptist told Andrew and told John, he said, listen, this is the Messiah. Stop following me. I mean, this is, this is him. This is the one Moses talked about. This is the Christ. This is the one we're waiting for. You remember Andrew went and got Peter? And what did they do? They started acquiring, is this really who he is? They started following him. And this stage, in my opinion, lasted way longer than it should have. Because Matthew's gospel tells us that one time they were fishing. And they were out fishing, Peter and Andrew and James and John. And Jesus comes walking by. And they had already hung out with Jesus. I mean, he had already renamed Peter. Isn't that weird? Like, hey, nice to meet you. My name's Simon. No, it's not. It's Peter. Okay, whatever he says. You know, I mean, they had already hung out with him a little bit. And they were still in this inquiring stage. They went back fishing. Matthew's gospel writes that Jesus came up one day, and Jesus says, follow me. 
and they get off their boat and they follow him. And then Jesus walks down a little bit further, says James and John, who they were working for uh, their father, they're in the fishing business. And he says, follow me. And they left their dad. I mean, what kind of employees has he got? I mean, how do you explain that? Hey, dad, I'm going to be gone for a while. I'm going to have the clock out. I'm following the guy with sandals. You know what I mean? Well, how long? I don't know. It could be a month. could be a year. could be a day. I don't really know. But we're just going to tell mom to keep the, 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 the lasagna hot. I'm following this guy for a little bit, the guy in sandals. I mean, I read that and I think, what? <laughs> Why would they just leave the dad and follow? Because the guy came by and said, follow me. You know, what kind of people? But here's what it was. See, Andrew had done heard from John the Baptist and said, this guy may be. <laughs> he may be the guy that Moses talked about. This guy may be the Christ. And so it was in this stage of them inquiring that they said, Dad, hold off on the fish for a little bit. i got to go find out for myself who this guy is. And they were in this inquiring stage of asking questions and find, listening to his teaching and finding out who he is. And maybe you find yourself in that stage. And I can tell you just, just from my point of view, inquire. Maybe read your Bible a couple, you know, a couple times a week. Or maybe come to one of our classes. It's okay. Ask questions. Find out for yourself. Investigate and find out for yourself who Jesus is. I've often said if people would just spend one hour, one hour of their lifetime studying the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can't help but find out that it's true. He is who he says he is. Verse 5 says this. Again, they stayed in the inquiring stage so long. Luke talks about it. There's a doctor named Luke. I call him Dr. Luke. He got all his information from eyewitnesses, which is a great credible way to do so. And Luke tells us about a time that apparently they left uh, and they left, you know, their dad on the boat, and they start to follow him, and then they come back, and they're fishing again. So they're still in the inquiring stage. And here's what he says in Luke's gospel. It says, So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake at Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, which is Peter, and he asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the multitude's from the boat. So here's the picture. Here's the picture. The fishermen, they fished at night. You, you know this. I've taught you this, this before. They fished at night because in that area is very hot. And during the day, the water is too hot. So the fish go down deep. Their nets would not reach down there. How they fish is they had a boat here, a boat here. They spread a net and they drag it at night because at night the water would, would cool down and they'd come up. That's how you catch fish. You don't fish during the middle of the day in this particular region. And so they had fished all night. They'd worked the night shift. And then here comes Jesus, this guy that could be the Christ, could be the Messiah. They've already checked him out. They're still in this choiring stage. Here comes Jesus, and he says, can I borrow a boat? And the reason he borrowed a boat is, you ever notice how sound would carry over water? And so he's using this as an amplifier. And so he's out there preaching from Peter's boat. And he's preaching, and they're mending their nets. They're getting all their stuff back up. And it's 5 o'clock somewhere. They're ready to get off. They're about to have to start the whole deal over. They work the night shift. They're trying to get done. They're almost done. If they can just take a little break, go take a nap. But here comes Jesus, and he's preaching. And they're almost done mending their nets, and they're getting the Budweiser bottles out of it, and they're they're doing the whole deal. And they're almost done. But yet they're cleaning their nets and listening to Jesus. Cleaning their nets, listening to Jesus. Cleaning their nets. And what are they doing? They're again inquiring, aren't they? They're learning about who he is. And then Jesus does something. Jesus takes them to the next stage. Jesus does something. He calls them to get a little bit inconvenient. Calls them to get a little bit inconvenient. Here, here, here's what he says. This is the inconvenient stage. It's the third stage, by the way. Verse 4 says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, who's Peter, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master. Now that's interesting. He's just being respectful. He, he, he's not Lord yet. He's just being respectful. He's just saying, Master, look, you're, you're a preacher, you're a rabbi. I'm a fisherman. <laughs> He says, we've told all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, I've taught you this before. It's interesting. Jesus says, let down the nets. He's saying, you've got it all cleaned up. Let down your nets. I'm going to show you something. And, and Peter says, no, I can give you all the nets. I just spent hours cleaning those. But I'll give you a net. I'll give you, I'll give you a net. I'm not going to do all of them. I'll give you a net. And, and I understand. I mean, it'd be like me seeing you got a four-wheeler and you just spent hours cleaning up and me Passing by, I said, whoa, you got a four-wheel. Let's go four-wheel riding. Let's go ride some trails, hit some mud. You'd be like, dude, Pastor Brent, that's nice. I'd like to sometimes, but not now. Just cleaned it. Or if I saw you had a horse, and you just spent hours cleaning the horse and putting up the saddle, and I said, wow, you got a horse? Let's go ride. 
You'd be like, nah, we can ride, but not now. I just spent all this time. That's what's happening with Peter right now. He just spent all this time getting all the nets ready for the next night. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. He's ready to clock out, and Jesus says, hey, I got an idea. Let's go fishing. Let's go out here and let out all the nets. And Peter says, Master. And I believe this is a a changing point in Peter's life. I I believe we wouldn't know who Peter is if he wouldn't have done this. Something in him said, "I'll, I'll trust him. Something in him, I don't know if it was Andrew's voice in his ear saying, he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. That's what John the Baptist, his cousin, this could be him. I don't know what it is, but he gives Jesus just a little bit of trust, doesn't he? He said, Lord, I can't do all that. It took hours. Tell you what, make a deal with you. I'll do it. I'll, I'll give you a net. And they go out, and they go to drop out these nets. And here's what I find. Here's why I call this the inconvenient stage. He's asking Peter to do something he's done a thousand times, but just in a different way. Asking him to do something he's done a thousand times in a different way. Maybe just maybe you find yourself in the, in, the inconvenient stage today. And God's asking you to do something that you've done a thousand times in a different way. <laughs> he's saying, listen, listen, listen. I know it's inconvenient. You come to church dry. They're doing a baptism service. You don't want to leave wet. It's kind of what? Inconvenient. <laughs> I understand that they've got classes, they've got fellowship stuff. You know you ought to be in a class, but, man, your schedule's so busy, it's kind of inconvenient. Or I know you've been here for a long, long time, and maybe you've been in the choiring stage too long, and now it's time for you to get back and start to serve or do whatever, but it's just so inconvenient. Or maybe you've been one of these Christians that you said, if this person would live like Jesus says, Jesus says, Jesus says, and they're not living like Jesus says, and Jesus says, look, let me figure that out. Just follow me. Forgive them. Move on. Get my relationship with me. Just, just, just let me handle it. I know it's a little bit inconvenient, but just do it. And that's what he does here at the moment. He says, Peter, I want you to do something that I've asked you to do a thousand times, but I want you to handle it in a different way. And maybe God's calling you to do something that's a little bit inconvenient. Can I tell you, just like Peter, you have no idea, no clue what God can do in your life if you just simply follow him. And now here they go, and, and he's about to drop in the nets. And, and here he is, verse 6 says, And they had done this, when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Imagine if they would have put in all the nets. So they signals to their partner. Now this is James and John, the one that last left their dad. Apparently the fishing business is hard to find good employees, so dad hires them back. <laughs> and he signaled for James and John, and, and, and in the other boat they came to help. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. And he says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Simon. A few breaths earlier, you were saying, Master, Master, you know, Jedi, (laughs) Rabbi, I'll give you something. Uh, You crazy person, preacher that's asking me to go fishing, I'm the professional. Master, respectfully, I'll give you a net. And now he's on his knees saying, O Lord. You are who you said. And I believe that we wouldn't know who Peter is had it not been for this moment, this moment in time where he trusted him and said, I I trust you this much. I'll simply do what you said. And I'll follow him. You know what I find fascinating? Here's what I find fascinating. We often critique some of the faith of the people in the Bible. Jesus never said, I said, let down all the nets. You're out. (laughs) You're out of here. Go get me another fisherman. Go get another. He never did. Jesus said, "I, I get it. I see where you're at. And I'll take that much faith. It's okay. I'll take that much of a step. And I believe that just like Peter, you today have no idea what hangs in the balance. No idea what God wants you to do. For some of you, it's such a small thing. For some of you, it's forgive someone. For some of you, it's it's get baptized, get in a class. It's such a small thing, and maybe it's inconvenient. For some of you, it's just God's prompting you to read your Bible just 15 minutes a day. Just pray 15 minutes a day. And it's something so small that you think, ah, it's a net, Jesus. It's a net. It's not all of But you have no idea, like Peter, what hangs in the balance of your decision just to simply follow him, just to simply follow him. I often think about, what if if Jesus would have gave Peter a glimpse into his future? Imagine that. What if they'd have stand there and before he asked him to take out nets, he'd say, hey, Peter, Peter, come here, come here. here. I want to show you what your life is going to look like if you just allow me (laughs) to take you fishing. And he'd open up the future, I imagine this little bubble deal, and he says, look at this, Peter. Thousands of years later, people are going to know who you are. They're going to read about you. 
thousands of years later, they're going to be following your teachings. The whole world will know who you are. Matter of fact, Peter, Peter, they're going to build this place after you called the St. Peter's Basilica. It's going to take 118 years to build this. It's going to be over your very grave, and people will travel from all over the world just to be here. I mean, Peter, look at the inside. I mean, the greatest, greatest artist in the world's painted that, and that's right over your grave. I mean, Peter, 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 would you allow me <laughs> to take you fishing? Would you let out the nets? Can you imagine what Peter would have done? Yeah. Have the whole boat if you want to, Jesus. You can have the business. You can have it all if you, if you like to. Have it all. Peter had no idea what hung in the balance of that little bitty step, little decision just to follow him and nor do you. You have no idea, whatever stage you're at, of what God can do in your life, what hangs in the balance if you simply follow Jesus. And I find it fascinating, too, that Jesus says to them, you remember Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll, you'll catch men. And you got all these fish flopping around, two boats full of them, and Jesus looks and says, no, nah, don't, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll catch men. And I believe him and the disciples thought, have no clue what he's talking about. <laughs> to be honest, it kind of freaks me out. I've never, I don't really know what kind of bait to use to catch men, but your Lord, I'll go with it. Let's, let's just say yes at the same time. Ready? Yes, we will follow men. Yes. Yeah, we'll catch men, right? right? Yeah, that sounds good. He didn't know, but at that moment he said, Lord, wow, this is who he says he is. I love that he picked fishermen. Here's why. It's symbolic. See, a fisherman does what? They catch something alive, they make it dead so they can eat it. He's saying, listen, that, that's good. Catch it alive, make it dead so you can eat it. I want you to go out and catch men. I want you to catch them dead, dead in their sins, dead, separated from God, headed to, to hell. I want you to catch something dead. And I want you to bring in a relationship with me and make it alive. <laughs> That's what I want. You, you're going to fish. You're going to use the same skill. You're going, to, you're going to catch them alive, make them dead, or you can catch them dead to their sins, bring them to me, and I can give them eternal life, and I can give them a relationship. And it's not by do this, do that, or don't do that. It's just bring them to me and allow me to do my work in their life by simply following me. And that's what Jesus wants to do. Jesus wants us to strip away a lot of the stuff we try to earn his love and know that he already loves you. Can I burst your bubble for just a moment. If you do all your list of religious activities that you feel you've got to do for God to love you, let's say you do them today, and tomorrow you just utterly fail. You fail. Can I tell you, it is what it is. God loves you as much today as he does yesterday, today. It does not matter. It's not based off of us earning that. He loves you. Loves you despite. He loves you on your worst day. Loves you on your best day. God can, matter of fact, love you no more than he does in this moment right now, no, no, no less. He, he loves you to the extent of his love. And God wants an extraordinary and invites us, whatever stage you're at, to have a relationship with him. Now, the final stage there is the intimate stage. It's the intimate stage here. And this is what verse 9 says. It says, For when all who were with him were astonished at the number of catch they had, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. You'll now catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all. And what did they do? They followed him. They forsook all and followed him. I believe that every one of us, that God wants us to reach this intimate stage of our relationship with him. Amen. You know what happens when we enter that stage? We say, God, just like Peter did, you're Lord. Whatever you want, I want what you want. Whatever your will, I'll do whatever. You want me to throw out the nets, I'll throw them out. Whatever you want of me, I want what you want. And that's what Jesus requires. And here's what I found about the intimate stage. Just like he told Peter, he said, don't be afraid, you'll catch men. When you are at an intimate relationship with Jesus, you cannot help but catch other people. You cannot help but go into the, you know, the, the, the grocery store and you're soul conscious. You see other people as a soul, someone who may or may not know Jesus. You can't help that when you're pumping your gas to see the person next to you and think, I wonder if they know Jesus. When you get to that stage, you want to catch men and want to catch women and say, how do I reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And you become multipliers. That's, that's what the intimate level of Jesus will make you want to do. You'll want to reach other people. And I, let me speak to believers just in closing for just a moment. I never want us to become a church so content on just believing right and behaving right. That scares me. I never want us to become a body of believers just to believe right and behave right. You know that story we opened up with, with Matthew? Here's Matthew, and he's, Jesus is in his home, and there's sinners all around. And you remember the Pharisees, the religious people, were on the outside. They weren't in the works of Jesus. They were on the outside, and they were critiquing. And the Pharisees believed right. <laughs> they behaved right, but they weren't in the room with Jesus. 
They weren't participating in the work of Jesus. And I never want us to get caught up on so many rules, so many religious activities that we believe right and we behave right. And without knowing, we become a Pharisee. And without knowing, we become and we find ourselves on the outside of the work of Jesus because Jesus' greatest work is always with sinners. Always. It is what it is. It's always with sinners. We ought to believe right. We ought to behave right in order to bring right, to bring the right people to Jesus, right? We ought to believe, we ought to behave in order to bring, to bring people to Jesus. And when you fall in love with Jesus and you find yourself in that intimate stage with Jesus, you can't help but want to bring other people. Remember that slogan I used to say about drunk driving? They say, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, church people, people that love Jesus, if you're a Christian, you don't want to come to church alone. You know, think about this. Think about if we took that slogan and we adopted it to the church. And we said, if you're a follower of Jesus, friends don't let friends come to church uh, by themselves. We're going to bring unchurched people. Can you imagine how you change the world? I mean, you'd absolutely change the world. If every believer said, you know what, I'm going to church today. Let me bring an unchurched friend. You'd change the world. Just that one thing. Yet when you find yourself in love with Jesus, you'll want to do that. You'll want to bring people. You'll want to speak to people about Jesus. And so I don't know what uh, stage you find yourself in. Maybe you find yourself in the irreligious stage, and maybe God's just asking you to come back. J- just come back next week. Or maybe in just a moment you say, you know, I hear enough. I want a relationship with you, and I'm going to tell you how. Maybe today's your moment. Or maybe you find yourself in the inquiring stage, and you say, maybe I need to get in this Discover class, or maybe I need to get baptized, or maybe I need to, need to learn a little bit more about them. Do whatever he's telling you to do. Or maybe you find yourself in the inconvenient stage, and you say, today's probably my day to get baptized. Or I'm going to go get my kid downstairs, and we're going to go out here and make the decision. Or I'm going to start a quiet time, or I'm going to get in a class, or I'm going to teach a class. And maybe he's calling you to do something. My word to you would be just follow him. Or maybe you find yourself in the intimate setting with him, and he's saying, look, don't forget, it's not just about believing right. It's not just about behaving right. It's about bringing people who are far from me to enter into a relationship with me. And so I don't know what stage you're in, but God extends to you an invitation today to simply follow him. And like the people we read about today, you have no idea what your life can be like if you simply follow him. Now, I never like to end the message without giving you an invitation to follow Jesus. It's the most important time of the entire sermon. If you heard nothing yet, if you, matter of fact, if you fell asleep the whole time, that's okay. Make sure you, you, you hear this, okay? I know there's a lot of churches that don't do invitations and uh, they, they, they call it seeker sensitive and we don't tell people about how they can know God and maybe they'll come back next week. I'm not that kind of church. I love you too much. Okay. I, I know that there's a real place called hell and a real place called heaven. And I want you to be there with me. And so Jesus loves you. Let me tell you real quick, the gospel story. If you want a relationship with him, God loves you. Here's how I know he loves you. He's holy. <laughs> he's perfect. If he's holy, if he's perfect, if he's really God, he must judge sin. But he, he loves us so much, loves us so much that he sent his own son to live a sinless, perfect life, to die on a cross for our sins. And his son willingly laid down his life. His son wasn't a victim. He willingly lived the perfect life and laid down his life and said, I'll stand in their place. I'll take their punishment. And holy God, the only time he was, the only time he was in a spot with his son where he says, I'm so disappointed in you, was when? When he took on my sins and he took on your sins on the cross. And his son willingly laid his life down. And God poured out his wrath against sin, my sin, his anger, his hatred towards my sin on his own son. His own son gave his life and bled for me and for you and went to a grave. And he didn't remain there. He rose from the grave three days later. I mean, that's fact is a fact. That proves that he is God. He's the son. I've said all the time, show me a God who lives sinless and who rose from the dead and we can have an intelligent conversation. But until then, we, we can't. Jesus is Lord. He proved it through his resurrection. Now, why did he do that? He did that so he can have a personal relationship with you. He's holy. Our sin separates us from us. But when Christ died for us, we are now reconciled and can have a relationship with him. If you don't have a personal relationship with him but you want one, I want to lead you in a prayer at this moment in order for you to do so. So would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Father, thank you so much for your word to us today. Lord, it's my prayer that whatever stage we find ourselves in, that we would simply muster up the courage to just follow you. Lord, I pray for the people who are here today who do not know you, but yet they want to know you. They want a relationship with you. If that's you, simply say this prayer in your heart and you believe on it with everything you've got. If you want forgiveness of sins, a relationship with with God, and eternal life, just simply pray this prayer and you believe on it with everything you've got. Say, Father, I know that I'm a sinner. 
and I know that I cannot save myself. I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I believe that your son Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that your son Jesus is Lord. So come into my life today by faith. I receive your gift of salvation. I'll never be ashamed of you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you just gave your life to God, that's the most important moment in all your life. But I'm going to ask you to take a step further. Um, I'm going to ask you to do what's called a public invitation is what we do here at Cascade Hills. So if you gave your life to God and you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you during our next worship song, if you would stand with me and come down to one of these couples and just say, I prayed that prayer. We want to get you some information to get you started out right in your Christian journey. Here's why this is important. If you notice everybody that followed Jesus today, he always did it in a public setting. He walked by Matthew with his crew of sinners over there in the tax collector's booth, and he said, hey, follow me. He, he did it over and over and over. He does that because he wants us to know that we know that we know that we're part of his family. And he, he said one time that if you deny me in front of men, I'll deny you in front of my father. And so if you made that decision today, I highly encourage you to come down and make it public. Or maybe just maybe you want to be baptized today. You say, I put on long enough. I'm tired of being in the in inconvenient stage. I, I'm going to do it. Well, come down and tell one of our people, I want to be baptized today. But whatever that decision is, I believe that Jesus extends to you that same invite. He says, follow me. Follow me. And you have no idea what that can lead to. So would you stand with me? As we sing, you come. Now's your moment. Now's your time. God can do something incredible in your life if you'd allow him. If you'd open up your heart to him, he can do something incredible. Maybe you're watching me online. There's a number of the on the screen. I want to hear from you. Now is your time. Now is your moment. Would you follow him? He extends the invite to all. But what would you do with it? You have no idea what he wants to do in your life if you follow him. God bless you from all over this room. Maybe you're watching me online. I'm so proud of you. I want to hear from you. Maybe you're watching online and it's time for you to make it. To let me know about it. God can do something great in your life, but it starts with opening your heart towards it. Altars open, the lines are open. I'd love to see what God can do in your life if you'd allow it. Last couple calls, last couple verses. I'd love to see what He can do in your life if you'd allow Him to work in your heart. If you're watching me online now, it's your moment. Hey, thank you for visiting us today. And if this ministry has touched your life in any way, please send us your story to I am at CascadeHills.com. And if you'd like to help support this ministry financially and help us spread the word of Jesus Christ around the world, you can go to CascadeHills.com or our Cascade Hills app and select the Give button. We hope you enjoyed the services today. Tune in next week for another great message.